Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I want to give you a tool that I used in my own life after I got a comment from one of you asking me about intimacy. Before we jump into that, I am drinking a compote. Compote. My husband made it for us. It's lemon, orange, pear, and apple. And basically, we just like boiled up the fruit and then we're drinking it very diluted with a little bit of honey. It's really, really good. It's really like cleansing but also slightly bitter you know my grandma my nana growing up she would take in iraq they would dry out lemons and then they would take those lemons and boil it into like a tea and then they would make us drink it when we were sick it was like my best worst memory as a child because i was sick it was so bitter but it would make me feel a lot better so it kind of reminds me of that a little bit but like i said i'm drinking it very very diluted so i've added a bunch of water and i really think that helps make it you know less intense unlike when I was a child with that said it's really really good and I do recommend you trying it for this winter season mm, okay it comes out different every time I do it because sometimes I dilute it more than other times now it kind of tastes like apple cider vinegar but not does that make sense all right let's get into it so I got this comment and I thought it was a really good comment sort of asking me about intimacy. Let me see. Let me read it to you guys. It says, hello, can you make a video about how to have intimacy with a partner, both physically, mentally and emotionally, and how to know which intimacy is inappropriate? Now, you guys know, look, I'm just a person. I'm not an expert in anything. I'm just an expert in my life. But I'm a person who has trialed and erred throughout her whole life. OK, I have failed a lot, but I've also succeeded. And the reason I think I have succeeded when it comes to intimacy is that I have really challenged myself to fight my own embarrassment and shame, but I've also challenged myself to make sure that when I'm engaging with things that are intimate, no matter if it's with friends, family, romantic partners, that I am asking myself, why am I seeking this closeness? You know, intimacy is a closeness. We're seeking a closeness with somebody. And for the sake of this video, we'll focus on romantic relationships and we'll focus on sort of a monogamous setting, though, of course, I think this is um, apl applicable to open relationships and polyamorous relationships. I myself did poly for 10 years plus and only recently decided to do monogamy. And I did monogamy. Um, well, I didn't do it for any particular reason, except it was the most efficient for my life and my partner. And that's what we decided to do. So I married in monogamous, as you guys know. And we sort of focus on, let me see, one, two, three, four specific kinds of intimacy. The fourth one that wasn't mentioned in the co comment I got was actually spiritual. I think it actually matters, but it might not in your relationship. So here's how it works for me. Hopefully this works for you. And if you have another tool that I don't have and that I don't mention today, leave it down in the sections down below so we can all benefit from your wisdom as well. So I wrote down... Um, you know, intimacy is about closeness. So what are your goals when it comes to this closeness? Often when people seek romantic intimacy, they're seeking sort of a reflection of themselves back to themselves, which I think is valuable because we want to be intimate with people who see parts of us. I think that's where the greatest intimacy grows is when you're with somebody who understands you so well, they can sort of like regurgitate your 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 ideas back to you. They're saying, I understand you. I see you. I'm, I can tell you, like I can understand you so well, I could basically speak for you. Not literally, right? Not literally, but sort of in a way that makes you go, oh yes, like you, you get me, right? So when you're seeking a romantic relationship with somebody, you've got this physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual part of it that I do think is a spectrum of easy to medium to difficult. So example, physical intimacy can be really, really easy to have with people because it's a closeness of the body or it can be really, really difficult, especially if you have trauma related to the body. So as you guys know, with my past, I was homeschooled. I went to public school for only a couple of years. I was pretty virginal my whole life. And even though I had secret boyfriends and girlfriends in high school, we mostly just held hands and on occasion pecked each other on the lips. It was really innocent until I was 22. I didn't really, you know, engage with people sexually. And then the t my 22nd year, like 21st to 22nd year, I just kind of like engaged. And even so, I chose people that I was friends with. And I think that really helped me feel okay being physically intimate with people because I liked my friends and they felt like safe people to engage with. And I made really good choices, uh, you know, in regards to who I engaged with. I've never regretted my engagements. I maybe regretted how some things happened, but at the end of the day, like I did consent to all those physical engagements, which was really, really lovely, especially as somebody who eventually went on to have a an assault in her background. 
knowing that I made all those choices was really rewarding for me. And so I think that helps. And that's not to say that if you're, that you're, if you have that background, it's not to say that that should in any way impede on your story. It's just for me, that's how it ended up going. So physical intimacy for me has always been pretty easy, whether it was wrestling with friends or hugging people or showing affection. Um, I never really felt guarded with my body until after my assault. And then I actually was so in my trauma about it that I didn't even like old ladies hugging me. I just felt like such a violation. And then, of course, I went to therapy and I meditated and I moved past that as well. So, you know, I, I went in and out a lot after my assault about like who could touch me and who can touch me and what was intimacy and what wasn't intimacy. So again, depending on your story, you have to know yourself well enough to know what is your relationship with that? Is it easy to be physical or is it actually quite difficult to be physical? Because you know, for some people, they don't grow up in a family that hugs. They don't grow up in a family that kisses and is open with affection. You know, I'm Middle Eastern, and even the men in our families are affectionate. They hug each other. They pat each other on the backs. They kiss each other on the cheeks. It's, it's very, like, affectionate and safe. Not everyone's going to grow up with that. So how did you grow up, and how, what is physicality for you? What is it easy or difficult? Do you have to kind of know yourself well enough to kind of answer that? And if you don't, Ask yourself until you figure out the answer, right? Emotional kind of follows. I put emotional can be medium, hard to difficult. I don't know if it's ever easy for people to be emotionally intimate with people. The closeness of it seems probably less likely, but I'm sure there are some people out there that are very easily emotional with people, connectivity, like in terms of connectivity and intimacy. But again, what is like that, like, real intimacy and what is performative intimacy. I think people who have a tendency to trauma dump, I think you could qualify them as people that are easily, intimately emotional with people. But I would argue that that, that true intimacy and closeness is not just trauma dumping. It's having a realization about the emotions. It's being vulnerable about the emotions. You know, when you go to a therapist, you're not always vulnerable with your therapist, even though you're telling them about your life. You ever hear somebody tell you like, oh, and then, you know, I got my leg cut off by a shark, but you know, it was another Tuesday. They're not being emotionally vulnerable. They're stating a thing that they could be emotionally vulnerable about, but they're stating it as such a matter of fact that they're actually not being vulnerable with you at all. So lots of people can tell you about things like earlier when I mentioned my assault, I'm not being emotionally vulnerable with you. I'm stating a fact of my history. I'm not getting vulnerable with you. And even though I have in the past been vulnerable with you about that subject matter, right now in this moment, I'm just stating a fact, right? So pay attention to yourself. When you're sharing something that's quote unquote emotional, when you're being emotional, are you actually being intimate or are you just say, stating something that should be and is perceived as emotional but isn't even, therefore isn't even vulnerable, therefore isn't even intimate, you're not getting close. You're not letting people close. You know what I mean? Then you go to intellectual, which again could be easy to difficult because if you're in a situation where you're on a date and you're talking about ideas and you guys are like, oh my gosh, vibing, 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 vibing. It's very, in you know, it's very easy to be close to somebody and to feel that intimacy and then mistake it for your soulmate. <laughs> I've had so many good intellectual conversations with the people in my life that because we're so vibing with ideas, we think we're being intimate, which we are, but that intimacy leads to long-term romance and it doesn't. So like I said, intimacy is a closeness. You can have it with friends and family and strangers. I can be very intimate with strangers on occasion because of intellectual connection. I can be very intimate with strangers sometimes because of um, even spiritual connection, which we'll get to in a moment. But with intellectual connection, I think as a young person, that's what I was seeking out my whole life. I was obsessed with reading. As you guys know, I've read thousands of books. I was obsessed with watching people debate. I was obsessed with politics. I was obsessed with ideas. And I think I was seeking out a sort of intimacy in that regard. And it was just probably why I'm not the most stimulated in online spaces, because they're not very intimate. They're talking about ideas, but they're not intimately talking about ideas, right? They're talking about ideas in a very like, yes, one time I was um, assaulted and I ate a pie the next day and I actually took a shower after. It's like, what? Like you're just stating things, but you're not like, what? You're not like 
talking about the ideas behind that. Well, how does that impact the person? How does that impact the day? Why did you eat a pie? Was it the only thing you could have that didn't remind you of your assault? Why did you take a shower? Did you feel dirty? It's like there's, you know, there's so much more to a person's experience, but that intimacy and that closeness is sort of very hard for people to engage with with most people, which is fair. But when it happens, sometimes we mistake it for for more than it is, right? Which is why I practice sort of an acceptance of whatever this is, I'll accept it. Next week's podcast is going to be about radical acceptance, the differences between therapeutic DBT radical acceptance and philosophy radical acceptance. Because I'm realizing because I'm a, I have borderline personality disorder and I've done DBT and I speak so highly of it. Every time I say radical acceptance, I think some people think I'm talking about therapy radical acceptance. I'm talking about the Buddhist concept of radical acceptance. I'm talking about philosophy. I'm talking about spiritualism. When I say radical acceptance, I'm never referencing the therapy because I'm not a therapist. I'm not we like, yes, we cover mental health here, but like I'm not a therapy channel. I'm a philosophy channel. So I was shocked a little bit when I read a couple of comments from people that are like, oh, Brittany, Brittany's like radical. She's become radical about radical acceptance. And I'm like, what? I'm not talking about the therapy radical acceptance. Guys, I'm a philosophy channel, so I'm talking about lifestyle. What lifestyle, a philosophy, are you engaging in your life, right? Hopefully one of your own making. I want to give you custom tools to have a custom life, right? So especially when it comes to the intimacy of your life, you should be custom, right? Don't don't follow just how Brittany did it. Don't follow how so-and-so did it. Make it custom to your life. So that moves into sort of spiritualism because you can intellectualize your life, but I think spiritualism is the foundation of your values. So I'm going to call it spiritualism for the sake of this podcast, but you're really saying, what is my belief about my consciousness? Am I unique? Do I exist? You know, do other people have the same amount of value that I do? Um, who am I? Am I a name someone gave me? Or am I more than that? Am I my gender? Am I more than that? Am I my body? Or am I more than that? Am I my brain? Or am I more than that? You know, in religious spheres, some of them believe like the soul, which I would just call the consciousness, is separate from the brain, which I would agree. I think even if your brain has shut down, there is a version of you that exists. I would call it your energy, which I think is mostly rooted in science, right? Because like we're recycled energy, we're atoms. So I would say like that is your consciousness. But then some people feel like your consciousness is your brain because without the brain's activity, how would you know you're a consciousness? Which I think is actually kind of the same thing we're saying. We're just intellectualizing something that I think we could also spiritualize. I think it is fair to say in some ways that you are your brain in terms of activity, but I would argue that my mental health is not who I am. So when I say my brain, my neurodivergency isn't who I am. It's not my consciousness. I would say that my neurodivergency is something my consciousness is aware that my brain does and therefore they're separate. But of course, if I'm in a coma, then my consciousness is not being interacted with and therefore I don't exist. But also I do exist because even people in comas, we consider them people that exist. So I think there's like a, a line that we have to draw when talking about What does it mean to exist? So that's that spiritual connectivity. Again, something that could be easy to connect on or difficult depending on how nuanced and deep you go in your own spiritual journey. Same with intellectualism. You can meet somebody who's just as intellectual as you and that could mean nothing or it could be something or it could be limited or it could be expanded upon. So again, so much of this is about you. Who are you? What are you doing here? How do you see yourself and what are your goals? So the question from the commenter was, how to have intimacy with your partner, right? So those are sort of the ways you can, you know, basically think about ways to have intimacy with your partner. But the second part of the question was the most interesting, and that's how to know if, how to know which intimacy is inappropriate. Now, I'm not exactly sure of what the question really wanted me to get at. So if you want to do a follow-up, you know, comment in the sections down below, please do. But when I hear that, I'm thinking about when you want something from your partner they're unable to give. And this is really difficult, whether it's a physical intimacy, an emotional, intellectual, or spiritual intimacy, not being able to get that from the person you expect it from is really, really, really difficult. Now, like I said, you can have intimacy with people you're not romantic with. You can have it with your children. You can have it with your parents. It's a closeness. That's what intimacy means. It's a closeness. 
Within context, we can separate it into sexual intimacy, intellectual intimacy, and so on and so forth. But generally, intimacy is just a closeness. So with those definitions and in that way of looking at it, what is your ideal goal and where are we right now is how I would sort of tackle that problem. Let's say you want to be physically intimate with your partner, but they're actually going through a stage of withdrawal and they don't feel safe being touched. It's not personal, but it has something to do with their trauma. You would engage with them intellectually in order to be physical with them in the future because intellectually and emotionally, you're going to meet them where they're at and you're going to say, oh my gosh, emotionally, I love you. I'm so sorry you're going through pain. I'm so sorry you're hurting. Let's intellectualize this and figure out how to problem solve it. Let's get you into therapy. Let's get you into whatever you need to do to sort of face this problem within yourself so we can be physical again and so you can have freedom again. Because remember, you know, intimacy is also a sign of safety. We want our partners to feel safe with us. We want them to feel free to feel intimate. You know, it, it's such a safety that I can just grab my partner and hug him whenever I want. It's just a safety that he can grab me and hug me whenever he wants. It's a, it's a signaling that we're safe, we're communicating, we're on the same page, I'm not withdrawing from you. And when I do withdrawal or he withdraws, well, there's a reason for it. What is it? Oh, we're overstimulated. We're tired. Oh, my body just feels so like confused right now. Oh, I'm not feeling very good. I feel kind of ugly. I've got the flu. and I don't feel like being intimate with you. Oh, I feel like my breath smells. Oh, I haven't showered today. There's going to be a reason. And I think it's very important to know that reason because just like the person who's, you know, um, withdrawing, uh, that other person doesn't want to make them bad for withdrawing. The person who's withdrawing, I'm sure, doesn't want to make their partner feel bad that they can't seek out this intimacy at the moment. Because again, intimacy is about safety. I feel close to you. I feel safe with you. I feel myself reflected in you and vice versa. So in order to be physically intimate, if there's a problem, you would intellectualize that problem, but also emotionally be available. So that leads us to like the spirituality of why we did that in the first place. Why did we value their emotions and why did we intellectualize a problem solving technique in order to be physical again? Because our values say that we want to be safe and sound for our partners. We want to be safe, sane and consensual. We want to be aware of the limitations we have between one another and the intimacy we're having with one another. We want to be able to say, hey, I love you. I love you so much. Thank you for giving this giving this time to me to withdraw into my body while I figure out what's wrong or, hey, I love you so much. Please take the time you need to figure it out and let me know what I can do to help you. Basically, you're a team and you're saying to one another, I don't want to be inappropriate. I don't want to cross your boundaries. I don't want to break your consent. I don't want you to feel insane for having a feeling or feeling withdrawn. Instead, I want to tackle it and I don't want it to fester or build I saw this Reddit post, and again, I don't know how many of these are real, but this person was saying, hey, I've noticed my girlfriend is acting, or no, I'm sorry, I've noticed my wife is acting very strange lately, and my wife wants to re wants me to refer to her as my girlfriend. She even took off her ring, started telling our friends that like she's my girlfriend, even though we've been married for many years. She's been acting very different, and I don't know what could be wrong. And I'm like, if my husband started doing that, so emotionally, I'd be very distraught. Intellectually, I'd realize something is wrong, maybe an aneurysm, a tumor in the brain, mental health, or something intense is happening. Because why would my husband all of the sudden want to be known as my boyfriend, right? If I was this Reddit user, why would you go to Reddit when you could go to the doctor? And that's because people forget to intellectualize. They just emotionally react. Something is going on. It's making me upset. Use your little noggin, okay, and figure out that you need to go to a doctor, but they might not even have the tool to know this is a medical problem. Look, if your partner starts acting completely different out of the blue, that's usually a medical problem or there's some sort of missing Miss, there's a gap in the intimacy, in the closeness. So either the intimacy gap got so large you disconnected and stopped communicating or your partner is severely mentally impaired or you're mentally impaired and something, something is going wrong, right? There's no way my partner and I would just switch it up after out of the blue because we're so connected. We talk every day. We're always together. It would be very strange if one day I woke up and I was like, I want to be vegan. He'd be like, 
That's super weird. Like, I mean, not that we're anti-vegan, but that's just so out of your character because I know you so well and we're so intimate. You share with me all of your thoughts. Why would you all of a sudden be vegan? Or if I came to him and said, hey, I think I want to be religious. It's like, oh, are you okay? Did something happen? Because we know intellectually that's not the person we married. Emotionally, it feels very scary because this person is unrecognizable and everything else moves into the spirituality aspect, the values aspect. Well, this doesn't coincide with our values. So why would you be religious all of a sudden? You're a queer person and most religions are anti-gay. And also there's no religion out there that you would want to join because you don't even like people. And it's true. I don't even like group activities. You think I'm going to join a church? So it's like, hey, what happened? Something completely shifted did and it's usually again the intimacy breaks so there's not a closeness or there's a mental health problem now mental health is anywhere from anxiety depersonalization disassociation distortion um, not understanding the self not understanding people around you there's lots of reasons this could happen hormonal imbalances accidental starvation you're working so much you have ADHD you've spaced out you haven't eaten in four days you know there's so many things that go into um, sort of breaking of the intimacy. And I think the inappropriateness does come in when you make, when you aren't willing to see the situation for what it is and you start assigning a reasoning to the situation that doesn't make sense. So again, your partner comes to you out of the blue and says, no more physical affection. I don't want to be affectionate with you. So you're emotionally hurt and you're like, oh my God, like, why would you do that to me? That's so cruel. Like, I want to be touched but you don't intellectualize it and you forget, okay, that's kind of odd. Why would my partner do that? Wait a second. This doesn't coincide with our values, the spiritual belief we have about the world, right? What is this thing? Like, what is this action that my partner is taking? It, it seems so foreign to me. So often what people do is they say in the physical and emotional part of their brains where, you know, they kind of, they kind of aren't, introspective, extrospective enough to sort of allow for the nuance of the actual situation. And we always think it's not going to happen to us. Our partner is not going to be the one with the brain tumor. Our partner is not going to be the one with the psychosis. Our partner isn't going to be, we're not going to be the, you know what I'm saying? So I would encourage you to do a checklist. That's what I do. So let's say my partner is like withdrawing from me. I'd be like, oh, emotionally, I'd be a little hurt. And I'd be like, oh, what's happening? And then intellectually, it's like, oh my gosh, is it your neurodivergency? Are you overstimulated? Should I back off? And then we would say, I love you so much. This is our spirituality, our values. I love you so much. It's totally okay. Please take your time. So we're really wrapping in all of those things. We're allowing the situation to be what it is. And we're allowing ourselves to emotionally feel the way we do, but also intellectualize it and also make sure that our, we're acting within our values. And my values say we don't break consent. So if my partner is overstimulated because of neurodivergency or whatever it is, it is not my job to then sort of intellectualize that I'm owed or entitled. You know, I don't like entitlement. I'm entitled to his body. Well, you're my husband and you should want to be with me even if you're overstimulated. That's what I hear from some people. There is a narrative in the world, there is a bubble that really believes like your spouse is sort of entitled to your body or vice versa. Like there's an entitlement. I'm not entitled to my husband's body, right? Like I'm not entitled to that. I take it um, when he gives it freely and only when he gives it freely. And I want him to do it because it it is something he wants to do and, and vice versa. I don't want it to feel forced to give my body, but I also would never emotionally use my physical form as a weapon against us because I'm uh, threatening sort of a lack of intimacy. When you're, when you're fighting with your partner, you are not being intimate. You are doing the opposite. You're, you're avoiding closeness. When you fight instead of understand your partner, you are denying intimacy in that moment. So every time you start to get angry at your partner, every time your brain is like, shut him down, shut the door, turn off your cell phone and drive off. Remember that if you act in that emotion, you're not, I'm not moralizing it. But when you act in that moment, you are denying intimacy, which is denying closeness, which is denying repair, which is denying like a continuation of this relationship and its betterment. Trust me, as a person that still suffers from intrusive thoughts, there are a lot of moments where I feel so like my intrusive thoughts are like run away, but my intrusive thoughts are stemming from much older trauma. They're not a reflection of what's happening in the actual reality of this relationship. 
which is why you need to intellectualize your emotions in a healthy way, not a negative way, and remind yourself that even though you're feeling this way because your intrusive thoughts are coming in, remember to actually do the math. I'm safe. Everything around me is okay. Nothing is going wrong. So why am I so upset? Well, because I probably have some old wounds that I'm working on. Okay, no problem. Remember to stay within your values and offer your partner a closeness and intimacy rooted in your consent. I actually um, am feeling a little vulnerable. I'm so sorry. I think it's making me ha- it's making it hard for me to open up, but I really want to. So can you give me a moment and then we can have the conversation. And then your partner would say, of course, absolutely. Let's make some tea and then we'll have the conversation, right? This is all intimacy. Intimacy is closeness, right? Now, if you want to know how to get closer and closer and closer to your partner, it's about building and building and building on that trust. That's why lying and cheating is the worst thing for a relationship because it erodes at that trust. Sometimes it crumbles it all the way down and there's nothing to build off of again. So every time you get that desire to fight because it's a defense mechanism you've learned from growing up, remember to consider being thoughtful in that moment and opening yourself up to intimacy instead. Now, of course, this is assuming you're with a person that's healthy and you're healthy, that you're working for the betterment of each other and that you're on a team. You might be in a bad relationship right now. You might even be in an abusive one. My question to you is know which relationship you're in, if you're in your forever relationship or in a one that's gonna give you a life lesson. And either way, strive for healthy because the healthier you are, the healthier your relationship will be. And if it's the wrong relationship, it will naturally break up because That's just what happens when you're healthy. The healthier you get, the more likely you are closer to your peace, your joy, and your happiness, right? Remember that happiness is an emotion that comes and goes, but joy is that foundational understanding of the self and your belief and what you're doing and what you rely on to get you through moments of conflict, right? It reminds you of like the humility and gratitude you have for sort of being able to exist in the first place, but also knowing your place in the moment like with this moment of conflict and what's happening. So let's say you're in a really healthy relationship and you're having a moment where you want to sort of add on to your relationship in a physical sense. You maybe want to try something a little new. One of the ways that I recommend engaging with that sort of intimacy is either reading books together, watching movies together, engaging with porn together, doing something that sort of allows you to, you know, give each other real life examples of what you might be into reading books like the ethical slut together or watching documentaries figuring out what sounds interesting what doesn't what's in fantasy land what's in real land what can you pretend to mimic what can you actually interject into the relationship and the physical stuff can be easier or hard because again it ties into the emotional maybe you're in a heterosexual relationship and you really want to try pegging but the male person is less inclined to do that because they're emotionally tied to the fact that they might be perceived as homosexual when they don't want to be associated with that right well that takes a lot of intellectualizing and understanding your emotions and why they're happening and then coinciding with your values of do I believe in the closeness with my partner or am I going to bring the shame of the bubble into my relationship are you going to allow other people who have never met you to shame the intimacy you're having with your partner let's talk about that and why that's happening right there's so much that goes into this but in my opinion all these four things physical emotional intellectual and spiritual tie into one another and coincide with that goal you're aiming for. So what's the ideal relationship and how close can we get to it if not if if we if we can if we can't hit it perfectly, right? And then that really matters depending on where you are right now. So are we in a space where we can talk openly with one another? Am I going to be shamed by my partner by bringing up a sex position I'd like to do? Am I going to be shamed by uh, my partner for crying in front of her? Let's say you're a guy. Am I going to be shamed by my partner because I actually don't know what they're referencing in terms of this, in terms of this like quote unquote intellectual idea? Um, Am I going to be laughed at by my partner for bringing up my spiritual beliefs? You have to make sure you guys are on the same page in terms of values and how much openness you allow in the relationship to exist and not to shame or blame one another for not engaging in that activity and but instead to ask ourselves are we well suited and if we aren't well suited is it okay if we go our own way I know I'm asking you to intellectualize or sort of have a very mature reaction to a breakup but I'm telling you it's going to be hard either way but the best way to make sure it's a consensual breakup is to really accept 
that there is a realness to partnership if you're looking for that, if you're looking for long term, that involves an intimacy that needs to be grown and needs to be rooted in trust. And it's not going to grow without the right proper amount of openness. So it's better to figure that out as you go along, if not, you know, right away to know where you're headed. Because I think the best, in my opinion, tool for a long-term successful, healthy relationship is intimacy and closeness. And that is rooted in trust. And so that usually coincides with spirituality slash values. So like religious belief, idea belief. What do you believe about the world? What do you believe we're doing here? What do you believe is good or bad? What do you believe is moral or immoral? All of that stuff is going to erode at a relationship. So again, you want to make sure you're kind of on the same page in these four four categ- in these four categories. But that see how that like ends up being about yourself. It's not even about your partner. It's about you because you have to know this about yourself. Then they have to know this about themselves. And then you guys need to come together and exchange notes and see how compatible you are. And then you have to build off that compatibility. And then you have to communicate in a way that translates to the both of you. So ultimately, this is always about you. How to better yourself so you can communicate yourself better to people. All right. I hope that made sense. I'm very interested to see your comments. And to the person who originally wrote this to me, I'd love to hear if you had um, follow-up ideas, different concepts you wanted me to cover, something you were hoping to hear that I didn't put in today's podcast, because I love this idea. It, It really helped me even solidify some of my reasoning or thoughts around my own relationship. And honestly, I'm so grateful every day that I've done so much work to figure out who I am so I can have a very communicative and open relationship with my partner. There's no way Brittany in the past, 10 years ago, Brittany, she had so many walls up. She was not interested in being vulnerable. She certainly didn't want to be intimate with people. She was open to sort of casual intimacy, slight intimacy, but oh no, she she had so many walls up and for good reason because she was traumatized. And it wasn't until she went on the journey of healing that I could get to this person here and be so much more, um, you know, I'm just a scarred person now, but I'm not the wound isn't open and bleeding anymore. And that's an amazing place to be in in life. And it's so possible and so real for so many of us. And I am excited that these scars, though they will never go away, aren't open anymore. And I'm so lucky, but it didn't just happen. It took a lot of work, a lot of introspective challenge, a lot of work on my end to know when it was reasonable to be intimate and when it wasn't, when I was willing to get hurt because I was intimate and when I wasn't, and recognizing that getting hurt is a good consequence of intimacy in a way because it's an attempt. It's an attempt. You want to trial and error your life, just be reasonable with how risky you're being, right? Okay. See you guys next week for the differences between radical acceptance therapy and radical acceptance philosophy. And please let me know in the comment sections down below if you have any questions about that particularly, so I don't forget to put them in the podcast. And again, let me know what you guys thought about today's podcast, because I am curious. And with that said, I will see you next week. Okay. Bye. My head in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, dun, dun.